Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 316, recorded Monday, October 2nd, 2017. Lila Jana, give work. Triangulation is brought to you by Eddie Bauer. This winter, don't let cold hold you back from getting outdoors. Eddie Bauer's new Evertherm down jacket is unlike any other. No quilting, no cold spots. This is down. Available exclusively at Eddie Bauer stores or eddiebauer.com slash evertherm. Eddie Bauer, live your adventure. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the most interesting people in technology and spend an hour with them. And I always look forward to doing this. Uh, as you probably have noticed, uh, I'm not always doing it anymore. We have uh, other great hosts, and I wanted to give them all a chance, Megan Maroney and Jason Howell and Father Robert, a chance to talk to some of these interesting people. But every once in a while, I want to come in because I want to meet somebody and talk to them. And this is one of those cases. Our guest uh, today is Lila Jana. She's the founder and CEO of, of two very interesting companies, which we'll talk about in a second, Sama Source and LXMI. Or do you pronounce that 66, 60... Lux me. Lux me. <laughs> I'm not even close. Hi, Lila. Welcome uh, uh, Welcome to, uh, to Triangulation. It's great to have you. And I'm going to mispronounce your name at least once, so I'm just I'm warning you. L-E-I-L-A, Lila Jana, J-A-N-A-H. So you have, I mean, if you have a, you went to Harvard, you've been um, uh, a, a, a distinguished professor or uh, associate at Stanford. You have a, a very upscale education and background. Uh, and and yet, you've decided that you want to reverse poverty one job at a time. How did you come to this? Sure. You're well, also I, a founder, an entrepreneur. Yeah. I am. I love that you think that I have an upscale background. <laughs> I did get um, the very fortunate chance to go to Harvard for undergrad, but I actually came from a, a pretty low-income background. My parents were immigrants here, and uh, to get through college, I had three jobs. So. Wow. Part of my mission is to show people that you don't have to be a trust fund kid to go into social enterprise or nonprofit work, that there right. are many of amazing institutions, many amazing institutions that will support you in doing this Good. work. Neat. When did you first become interested in, 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 in reversing poverty? How did this become an issue for you? So I accidentally fell into this field. I, um, I had desperately wanted to leave Los Angeles. I was a high school student there and I had gotten a scholarship from a tobacco company of all places, um, the Lorillard Tobacco Company for doing community service in high school. And I felt this weird. was their penance for making everybody sick with cigarettes. Exactly, probably. they were yeah. giving away money to yeah. you know yeah. first generation feel kids better. like me to yeah. feel better about themselves. And um, and rather than taking it and using it for for college, which felt a little bit weird to me, I thought, well, maybe I can use it to go do some volunteer work. And I had also wanted to get out of LA, and so uh, the stars aligned, and I managed to graduate a semester early. And go. I love what you did. <laughs> it was it was an adventure, and really just inspired by my desire to to leave home before college. You went to Ghana. I went to Ghana. And I was assigned to teach English at a school for blind children in a rural town about two and a half hours north of the capital. I'd never been to Africa before. I had no family ties there. I'd read a little bit about West Africa, but I had no idea what I was getting into. Yeah. And I thought I'd go there and I'd save these poor African children and teach them English. And like so many international volunteers, I got schooled. Uh, my students could name U.S. senators. They were incredibly <laughs> Something bright. Something a lot of American students can't do. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, they could... They could talk about Bill Clinton had made an official state visit to Africa, the first in, in decades, I think, and, and everybody in Ghana was so excited about it. And my students were listening to Voice of America and BBC Radio, and they, they really, I mean, they spoke the Queen's English. Yeah. And it dawned on me that we have this myth about poor people, yeah. that they don't have the skill or the will to work. And so often, especially in very poor parts of developing countries, you have this immense talent pool that's totally untapped in mm -hmm. global markets. Mm -hmm. and, and have a thirst for knowledge and education and the chance to succeed uh, and just don't have that opportunity. 
Absolutely, and it, it dawned on me. I mean, if you are lucky enough to be born in America or a developed country, you benefit, at least in theory, from public institutions. I went to public school my whole life. My parents came to this country with nothing. My brother and I lived the American dream. And so I assumed that that was just possible for anyone who was willing to work hard enough yeah. and do well in school. And that's just patently untrue, obviously. Yeah. We yeah. live in a world that's dictated by an accident of birth. Where you happen to be born determines so much of your of your fate in life, and it needn't be the case. Yeah, that actually is true even in the U.S., isn't it? I mean, it's, it's not merely where you're born uh, internationally. It's here in the U.S. and how you're born and who to whom you're born and mm -hmm. the opportunities you get. And we later started a domestic program here in the U.S. called Sama School, which I get into in the book, and we talk about how challenging it, it has been to work in communities here in the U.S., which are even more disconnected than parts of Africa, like rural Arkansas, yeah. uh, which I talk about where we had to shut down our program because there was literally not enough internet um, and the literacy rates were so low. So t so when did you start Source? 2008. Yeah. Three Arguably years out of college. <laughs> yes, three years yeah. out of college and the worst month in the last hundred years, September 2008. <laughs> During the economic <laughs> crisis. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and it was a nonprofit. Yes, it's a 501c3, yeah. and I thought to myself, um, I want to build an organization that moves people out of poverty but uses the mechanism of the market and especially this new kind of digital work to do that. So this is a unique approach to it. I think one of the things, there's there's the Sama Source uh, website. One of the things that um, uh, we see a lot of uh, in this country is celebrities, I won't name names, but you know who they are, going to Africa surrounded by these poor our African kids and saying, please give uh, pennies because it can make such a difference in their lives. And I think that it looks to me a little bit more like the continuation of the white man's burden. Like, you know, the, we've got civilization and it's our job to, if uh, we don't colonize them anymore, but it's effectively economically colonize people to give them, you know, what we have. You don't come to it from that point of view. No, and you know, the thing about that model is that it's fundamentally patronizing. It's horrible. It sets up a relationship of us versus them, yeah. where them are these faceless, nameless, poor people who are desperate and needy, and, and it doesn't require us to examine the structures that lead to that situation. And if you really believe that talent is equally distributed, which I fundamentally do, then the only explanation for such extreme disparities in wealth is disparities in opportunity. And that's what we aim to solve at Samasource. Yeah. We are about giving people work rather than aid, which is a much more empowering relationship. It's saying, I value what you bring to the table. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to show you that the market values what you bring to the table, even if you are a poor young woman from a slum in Nairobi, which is one of the toughest places to grow up in a slum in the world. So yeah, tell me about some of the places that you go and that uh, we can make a difference in. Sure. So um, so I should say Sama means equal in Sanskrit. It's actually nice. the root word for same in English. Nice. I like it. And, um, and the whole mission of Sama Source is to connect people who are living under the local poverty line, which in most developing countries is under about 2 or $3 a day, wow. and to connect them to work that pays a living wage through right. technology. So we actually manage what's now the largest data services company in East Africa. Wow. And all of the workers come from extremely low income backgrounds. So under about $2 and 20 cents a day to give you an idea of what that's like. It means you live in a slum. So you live in a mud walled hut with a tin roof over your head. If you're lucky, you have no sanitation at home. You have no clean drinking water at home. You have uh, no access to proper health care. You are often eating. We find that many of our workers at that income level before they start with us are literally eating sugar cane as a primary source of calories because it's so cheap. So you're really living a life that no human being should be subjected to in 2017. And very quickly, um, once we hire people, we, we quadruple their incomes. What's remarkable is they stay at that income level even after they leave Samasaur. So they move out of poverty permanently. And we hire them to do uh, what we call micro work, small digital tasks for large technology and data companies around the world. Does this model work everywhere? It has worked really well in East Africa. We have um, now about 1,300 full-time workers in Kenya and Uganda. Doing we what? Also, 
have a center in India and Haiti. Uh, they're mostly doing various tasks for technologies of the future. One of the biggest areas that we specialize in is image tagging for computer vision. So the teams that are building self-driving car technology and other machine learning technologies, um, making machines smarter, um, those teams need high quality data. And we provide that training data for those algorithms. So yeah. believe it or not, you know, if you're in a, in a car that's self-driving or that's um, experimenting with self-driving, uh, that data may have been created by someone um, who has moved out of poverty as a result of this business model. It's, it's interesting. Instead of uh, traditional manufacturing jobs or, you know, making things, the data economy allows people to make a living. It is still kind of... Um, it's not manual labor, practically manual labor, though, right? It's We, we think of it as almost digital piecework. Um, yeah, there's the, a good way to put it. The benefit of this versus, say, a factory job is that by being connected to the Internet every day, there is a huge benefit beyond just the income you're making. You get exposed to the knowledge economy, and that is a really powerful thing. We see many of our workers graduate to start agencies on platforms like Upwork, where Neat. you can make a good living as a digital freelancer. Um, we see them for the first time joining Facebook and being active on social networks and producing content from places like Islam in Kenya. And I think that's really important. These people are becoming citizens of the future, um, not just workers toiling away in some factory who don't have an online identity. Right. Yeah, sure, if you're assembling an iPhone, there's no, there's no graduation from that. You're not learning anything. It's a very specific skill yeah. and it's kind of mind numbing. How are you helping, the, though, these workers learn more than just the simple data entry that they're doing? Sure. Well, we, we set up as a nonprofit because we wanted the social mission to always be the most important thing right. in our company. And so but it's still whole, a business in a way, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, yeah. it's a new category of business. We call it social enterprise or social business. Microfinance is another similar model. Mm -hmm. Many people uh, watching the show might be familiar with the like Girl Kiva Scouts. Or, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but even, even businesses like the Girl Scouts, the Girl Scouts sell a lot of cookies every year. That's part of a social enterprise a micro business. business isn't it? it's, yeah. it's a macro business. It's yeah. probably like, yeah, that's I don't a know good how many point. hundreds of millions of dollars of Girl Scout cookies right. are sold, but um, but it's actually a really smart way for nonprofits to build sustainability into their business. It means that I don't have to be entirely reliant on the whims of, of a few rich people to right. fund our operations, although who, I'm very grateful for the rich people who did fund our operations. Give, give them a plug. Who are, your, who are your donors? <laughs> a lot of our donors are actually large uh, foundations and institutions, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Google.org, um, The Rock Rockefeller Foundation, Cisco and eBay Foundations. A lot of um, tech companies. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Here in, in the Bay Area, uh, Tipping Point has been a big supporter of our of our San Francisco program. Right. We actually have a domestic uh, offshoot of Sama Source as well. And, and who are, so so they're sitting, uh, give me a, 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 a kind of a, a look at what it would look like to be a Sama Source employee in let's say East Africa. Sure, well, I'll use a story of uh, one of my favorite young women who works for us, Martha Karubo. Um, she actually was an orphan. She grew up in a slum in Nairobi, living on less than $2 a day as, a, as an orphan. She'd been lucky enough to get into this orphanage. And then as happens here in the US in the foster system, people age out. And so at 18, she was basically told, well, we love you, Martha. You're an excellent student. She was top of her class in her English classes, but she had nowhere to go and no job. It's incredibly difficult in a nation in which youth unemployment is 70% in Kenya. It's incredibly difficult for any young person to get a job, let alone an orphan from a slum with no connections. Yeah. So when I met Martha, she, um, she had just joined a training program. One of the nuns in her orphanage had recommended her to a feeder program. We work with a bunch of community nonprofits wherever we work at Tama that basically uh, train people in some of our most basic skills. So she'd gone into this feeder program. There she is. There she is. Wow. Martha Karubo. Look at that. That was her, uh, I think that was like two years ago. That's an Instagram post. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. So when I met her, I mean, she's got her hair done here. She's wearing a nice shirt. When I met her, Martha would not look me in the eye. She was looking mm. at her feet. She was wearing baggy clothes. She was so, mm. um, she just seemed almost ashamed to be alive. She didn't have any self-confidence. And one of the things we take for granted is that if somebody's never had a formal job, never known anyone who's had a formal job, they've sort of internalized this message about themselves that You're they're not worth worthless. anything. Yeah. Especially for young women growing up in developing yeah. countries. So Martha took this job. Um, 
we measure people based on results. Her results were excellent. She started doing data entry. She crushed it. She was quickly promoted. Um, the next time I saw Martha, like two years later, she was wearing a very nicely tailored dress. She'd gone to a tailor in Nairobi and gotten it. She'd done her hair. She was looking me in the eye. Um, Martha since left Sama Source and got a job working for a uh, travel agency in Nairobi in marketing. You and I last saw her. You can see in that picture a confident <laughs> young woman. You must be, you have an advantage because you're going there as a young woman yourself, a, a role model for them. You see, this is what's possible. Absolutely. And I guess, I mean, I mean if I went there, it wouldn't be as, <laughs> it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be inspiring for them, right? It you, would just be another, you know, imperialist coming here to dole out dollars. Yeah. I think what is remarkable is that, um, Ultimately, you know, we're all human. And yeah. when you feel those moments of connection, you realize like we're really all the same yeah, and we really course. want the same things. Yeah. And I think what's what's beautiful about giving work as opposed to giving a handout is it puts us on an equal playing field with the people that we are, we are I wouldn't even say helping, but the people who we're working, working with. Working with, we're teaming up. I think that's so important. It's a pernicious thing, uh, prejudice. And uh, in the developed world, we often talk about the underdeveloped or undeveloped or third world nations, and <laughs> and and it, it's still it, it it's it's a little bit uh, 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 kind of hidden. It's a little crypto prejudice because we well when we want to help them, we want to help bring them up, but it still comes as you say from a patronizing point of view that we somehow have it all going on, and and they don't, and those poor people, and we need to help. Uh, help them out. So I love the idea of instead of just saying, here's a buck, of saying, let's get you a job. But I asked the question earlier, and I want, I want to get more of a sense of how do they then transition from, you, you must start them out at, at data entry, the simplest possible mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe Do they know how to use keyboards? I mean, are they... Yeah, so we um, we do basic digital training. We so you do a, some training at, right up that's front. That's right. We call we have a program called Sama Source Digital Basics, and what we've done is we so there's no shortage of nonprofits in many low income communities. There's lots of pre existing nonprofits or non governmental organizations that have training programs okay. that teach life skills. Okay. But the problem is that that many of them don't have an ability to connect people to jobs. Yeah. So they might finish this great training program and there's no job at the end. And so we've gone to those nonprofits and we've said, hey, look, we actually have a job. You're adding the next piece to, to the puzzle. Exactly. Yeah. And so we give them our curriculum and we say, teach people these basic skills. And then okay. out of that group of people, we can then select our and, workers. And what are the skills? That they and need? so a lot of them are, are pretty basic digital skills. It's learning how to use a browser, yep. um, Googling things quickly, um, being precise and uh, having you know high quality and tasks you perform. So with image tagging, a lot of what we're doing when we're teaching a machine to recognize what's going on in images is simply outlining shapes in that image and and tagging them. This is a tree. This right. is a lane line. This is a human foot. Right. Therefore, the car will stop before it hits the human foot. Right. And so, um, so these are relatively simple tasks. But if you are someone who's only ever worked in the informal economy, which, by the way, this is an astounding statistic, but a billion people around the world work full time eight hours a day or more and still earn less than a dollar a day because they're working in the informal economy. These are the people who are sadly, you know, mining diamonds, right. um, working in a quarry, right. uh, selling stuff by the side of the road, working at piecemeal in a factory. Frankly, dead end jobs. You're never going to get to the next level uh, doing that. So what you're trying to give them is a job that they can grow in and get to the next level in and then have skills. Now, they still don't have internet at home. Is that so our workers will very, I mean, none of our workers really have internet at home okay. when they start with us. They don't us, have computers, they don't have technology. No, but very soon they're able to, one of the things we do with all of our workers is we bank them. So by virtue of getting a nice. paycheck from us, they have to have a bank account and there's nice. a whole process around, you know, getting financial literacy when you get a bank account. We even partner with local nonprofits to do that. And so what we see is that quickly people become eligible for loans. They start being able to get things on credit. Many of our workers instantly get a smartphone. They move out of the slum. It's quite difficult sometimes to own a computer or any expensive item. In There's an no area. electricity. No electricity, or even if there is, you're very likely to have your your small hut broken into. Right. There's no security. Of, yeah. And so, um, and then our workers are of course able to access the internet at our facilities anytime. And we have um, we have a model called the Sama Cafe, which we developed, which is like an internet cafe model where they can stay on their own time and do whatever they want on the internet. Um, this seems like the perfect <laughs> solution because you're you're creating something of value. It's a it's a it's literally can be a business, um, but you're also giving something of great value to those workers that they wouldn't get assembling an iPhone or mining diamonds. And what's remarkable is that so the model 
we have a few different models we've tested at Samasource. So we have this agency that we've we've built um, that does work for big companies that now employs 1,300 full-time workers and has employed about 9,000 people. So about 36,000 people, if you include the families, have moved out of poverty. We just started piloting a version of this, which is a little bit more like a franchise version. So we have this curriculum that teaches people how to do digital work remotely, and it's called Sama School. You can access the course for free online. We now have 50,000 people enrolled. And this works in places like refugee communities where we can't, we can't set up our own facility. We wouldn't have the ability to win client business and place it there. But an enterprising local person might say, oh, well, let me build a small facility where I train maybe 10 people and we have a little agency that exists on Upwork or one of these freelancer platforms. And we now have seen this operating. We've done a pilot in Beirut with Syrian refugees. There's a pilot underway in Jordan. Somebody did this in Ethiopia with uh, girls who'd come out of high school and didn't have jobs, who were very poor refugees living in Addis in the capital there. I mean, this, is, this model is theoretically possible anywhere where there's an internet connection and electricity. Interesting. And, um, and we've even made it profitable in some places where we've piloted this more kind of franchise version of our model. Yeah. Uh, we're talking uh, to Lila Jana. Her book, uh, which describes this and more, and we're going to get into it in a bit, is called Give Work, Reversing Poverty One Job at a Time. It just came out. It's brand new uh, from Portfolio Penguin, and we're going to talk about it uh, more in just a second. But first, a word from our sponsor, as we say, a brand new sponsor, and it's actually kind of cool. It's a company I've been, I've been uh, a customer of for many years. You ever hear of Eddie Bauer? Of course. Yeah, this winter, it's going to be cold this winter, and uh, you don't want to let the cold keeping you from going outdoors. But at the same time, you don't want to look like the Michelin Man in your giant puffy down jacket. So we've got something pretty exciting, whether you're uh, snow kiting in Minnesota or ice climbing in Colorado on a snowshoe trip through New Hampshire's White Mountains. You're going to want this. Look at this. This is Eddie Bauer's new Evertherm. It's a down jacket, but it's a good looking. It looks almost just like a, a windbreaker. But let me tell you, this is 30G thin down insulation. It's down fabric, so it's not the puffy loose clusters. Uh, there's no balling up. There's no migration. You can wash it easily. No quilting required. There's no cold spots. And let me get you, this, this is amazing. It's going to keep you warm down to minus 15, to 15 below without bulking up, down without the puff. It's got a slim profile. It's very light. This is the Men XL. This is mine now. <laughs> I just opened it. Uh, and uh, this is 11.36 ounces. It is, it is so light. And without the down, without the puff, without the quilting, your arm mobility is fantastic. It's wind resistant. Uh, it includes water resistant, storm repel, DWR technology. They've got sizes for men. They've got sizes for women. It has been tested by Eddie Bauer's world-class guides on Mount Everest, Kilimanjaro, and the Grand Tetons. And you know what I love about Eddie Bauer? All of their products guaranteed for life look at the the thermal pattern i don't know if, if you're watching the video or you can go to the website and see this at eddiebauer.com slash ever therm but the uh the 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 ir scan of this it's completely uniform compared to a down jacket which has cold spots because of the quilting and the puffs live your adventure where it's getting cold out there winter's coming ever therm down jacket from eddie bauer you get it at Eddie Bauer stores, which are always fun to go to, or online at eddiebauer.com slash everthern. I know you like winter sports. I do. And I'm going to try snow kiting this year. Are you? I'm a big kite surfer. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Crazy. In the water, though. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't that be great? I mean, this looks like a, it looks like a windbreaker. I would wear that in San Francisco in August. Also. <laughs> yes, it's great for summer in San Francisco, too, as well as Mount Kilimanjaro. EddieBauer.com. <laughs> Isn't that nice? It's so light. <laughs> Slash Evertherm. And uh, we thank them so much for their support of Triangulation. They want to keep our, our viewers and listeners warm this winter. My guest, uh, Lila Jana, is uh, really an inspiration. She's the founder and CEO of Sama Source. We've been talking about that. And Luxme 
Actually, Luxme is not your traditional cosmetics company either, is it? No, and it's so random. I never thought when I first went to Africa and de decided I would do this for my career that I would end up selling skincare products <laughs> on QVC. Um, but you know, that's I where think... you've seen her, folks. By the way, <laughs> she looks so familiar. Don't admit it, but you were watching Key QVC. Yeah, and you Friday saw... Night Beauty. I know that's probably a lot of overlap with your viewership. No, <laughs> um, but you know, it's on. It's Friday night. You got nothing else to do, right? Well, again, you know, I think the best way to fight poverty is to purchase things from low-income people. I love this idea. <laughs> and, uh, I if, love this idea. If we want to help, you know, we now know that women and children globally suffer most from poverty. The majority of people living on less than $2 yeah. a day are women and children. And again, our, our model is let's give them stuff. Let's help them. Let's build them wells yeah. and schools. But what they need more than anything is living wage Handouts. Uh, you know, this makes me feel good. And it's not that I'm cheap. It's not that I don't want to do charity. You want to do, do charity. It's important. But it's so much better for all involved to help them work, to give them, to act with dignity instead of here, you know, here you poor little person. I just love that. So, so Lux Me, when, when you use, when I buy that fine Lux Me, uh, Skin cream. Skin cream. <laughs> uh, I'm, it's, it's made, where is it made? So we source our raw materials. The raw materials. From northern Uganda, which That's many so cool. Americans know because uh, there was a documentary made about a warlord there named yes. Joseph Kony. Yes. Um, and uh, this area has had a 20-year civil war. Most of the victims are now women, many of whom live without their partners, so they're war widows. And uh, again, there have been so many nonprofit attempts to help this community, but I think that the best way we can help is, is by buying things from them. And so yeah. we employ very low income women to uh, harvest a wild ingredient uh, sustainably. It's called Nilotica. It's one of the best things you can put on your skin. It's totally organic. It grows wild at the source of the Nile. It's an heirloom variety of shea butter. And the idea is, you know, women in luxury markets spend so much money on these high priced skin creams. That money is going to big companies that are not owned by women, that don't support women in the supply chain, and that produce products that are often bad for us that have carcinogenic ingredients and artificial colorants and all sorts of other gross stuff. Why wouldn't we spend our money on luxury items that not only make us more beautiful, but make the world more beautiful? Yeah. And that's the idea behind LuxMe. We uh, launched, we're the first uh, fair trade and organic brand to launch at Sephora stores nationwide. We launched Great. last year in October. Great. And I sell it on QVC and we've done a few Great. other promotions. It's I love Sephora. LXMI.com. Yeah. LXMI. Lux me. Lux me. And that's the um, the product. So this is a, a rare nut that only grows wild at the source of the Nile. And in that jar are only 50 of these nuts that have been cold pressed. It seems different from Samasource, but basically the idea behind both brands is this idea of giving back by giving work and empowering people as equals um, who are living under the poverty line. And these are images, um, if you're looking at the at the show, uh, images of some of the women who collect these nuts for us in northern Uganda. I yeah. visit at least once or twice a year. That's important too. You you go there. You're talking to these people, so you're knowing. You know if it's working or if they just feel used. You know that it that it, it, it is changing their lives. Absolutely. We actually do um, very detailed surveys. Um, it's yeah. much more extensive at Samasource because we're older. We have an impact team. But if you go to samasource.org/impact, mm -hmm. you can literally see we survey randomly our workers. We produce and publish all kinds of impact data. We just embarked on a randomized control trial, which is very similar to like a clinical trial that's used for testing drugs to see whether they work. Um, we just launched that with Samasource, and there's now quite a lot of third-party impact evidence from auditors who've gone and looked at our model yeah. to see whether it actually works. You're on. Are you still on the board of care? I left the board you of left. care. Okay. I'm focused more on uh, on the care uh, advocacy work and right. uh, and social enterprise. So my, my passion is in showing nonprofit organizations how they can build sustainable business. That's models my question. And give work yeah. rather than than aid. That can, that, so aid at organizations like care uh, can they be reinvented to to support this kind of model? Absolutely, and I just had a really interesting call with Heifer International. And I love this Heifer. Morning, I bought a, amazing. I bought a goat or something. I bought a several. I bought several goats at Heifer. There you go. And I it's, love the idea. It's give work, right? Right. It's, um, it's give work through livestock ownership, and yeah. they're really interested. They're actually now starting to invest in social enterprises. This morning, I spoke with Conservation International, which is one of the best organizations preserving the little wilderness we have left on the planet. They are also investing in businesses like Luxme in other ways 
ways of promoting conservation that use the market as a powerful incentive mechanism to help local communities see the value of wild land. Yeah. And yeah. I think this is the future. So for so long we've said, okay, let's make as much money as we can in the private sector and then donate a little bit of that at the end of our lives or on Yeah, that's kind of the model, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that capital vastly, I mean it's it it doesn't it doesn't nearly compensate for the damage that we do in building businesses that don't do good in the world, right. that actively do bad right. often. So rather than build a business that pollutes It's that Lorillard guilt money is what it is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah. let's move away from the Lorillard guilt money and, and towards a model where we actively solve the problems um, rather than create them yeah. through the businesses we build. Yeah. I mean, I love the Carnegie libraries, but... <laughs> 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 so... Uh, is there still a role, though, for traditional uh, uh, charities uh, and, and, you know, giving charities? Absolutely. So I, I want to make this case, you know, I think that putting down charities or putting down people who want to help is is, is wrongheaded. I, I absolutely don't want to do that. I just want to show that there is a way to rethink the traditional model yeah. in many cases. Sometimes we need aid. For example, right. in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, people need the infrastructure rebuilt. In fact, the current era of international aid which is, you know, rich countries sending money to governments of poor countries. That really started, and this is hard to imagine, but that started when the U.S. started sending food aid to Europe during the Marshall Plan. That was when international aid began. We were trying to rebuild war-torn Europe. Right. We forget that the original aid model wasn't wealthy white people helping poor black and brown people. It right. was wealthy white people helping other white people right. who'd been devastated right. by the war. And and that model, after the rebuilding effort had been complete in Europe, that that uh, aid model switched to focusing on post-colonial economies in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, and uh, and the current era of international aid bega began. I, I love what you're doing uh, here with Give Work because I think sometimes you know, we all we all have our charities and we all give money, but sometimes it feels impossible. It feels overwhelming. And you really give hope here because you've got a plan that doesn't, it's not just pouring money down a well. It actually builds something and builds something that will have lasting value. I think that's really inspirational. It also, I think what excites me about this model is we're not depending on a different way. You know, we're not depending on people donating all their money. We're depending instead on people being aware that they're voting with their dollars right. every day. So I think about how apartheid ended. Apartheid was one of the greatest ills of the last century. It really ended when consumers decided to boycott South Africa. Right. In the span of three years in the UK, I read this recently in the 80s, um, textile imports went down by 35% because a bunch of consumers said, we don't agree with the South African regime. The only way we're going to fix it is by not buying stuff from them and forcing the government to take action and end this horrific yeah. separation of, of ethnicities. And so that worked. And I think what we're trying to do with Give Work is show people that we can do that. We can use market forces in a positive way as well by choosing to buy from businesses that give work. That's really encouraging. There is this kind of notion of slacktivism that, oh, people don't, you know, they give lip service to stuff. Uh, you know, I'm going to buy, uh, when I go down, I'm going to have fair trade coffee. You know, there mm -hmm. now I've done my part. Mm -hmm. But it actually does make a difference. It totally works. I noticed I actually had fair trade coffee in your coffee room of this morning. Of course you did. Um, and that <laughs> but we have actually, a choice. So choose fair trade. Absolutely. Choose fair trade. And we actually published something called the Give Work Guide. It's available at givework.org. And it's a guide for individuals who want to make ethical choices in their purchasing, but also, and importantly, for companies. This is a crazy stat, but the biggest 2,000 companies in the world, the global 2,000, spend $12 trillion annually on goods and services. To give you a comparison, the entire GDP of Sub-Saharan Africa is 1.8 trillion. Wow. So there's so much more money wow. in the money that companies are already spending. If we just directed a small percentage of that to sourcing from uh, ethical vendors like Samasource that give work, we could fight poverty without substantially changing the way the companies operate. Yeah. And I think that is such an easy win. To me, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. You talk in, in your book about what works, but you also talk about what doesn't uh, work. What what are we doing today? What things are we doing today that don't work? Um, so I think one thing that we've decided doesn't work is this large scale, often government to government aid, which doesn't come with 
mandates for direct benefits for the poor. It ends up often benefiting the dictator in charge well, the, or the war lord or, you know. If you think about it, a lot of the governments that receive this aid formed in a post-colonial era. They were set up to begin with by, by colonial regimes right. that were not really trying to benefit the no. local people. And so if you think about um, following the money, if you are a leader in a poor country and most of your money is coming from foreign donors, who are you going to be accountable to? What logically are you going to be spending your time on? You're going to be spending your time catering to those foreign donors, right? That's, by the way, the point of foreign aid, but okay, continue on. <laughs> but I think <laughs> we don't give that money just because exactly. we want to help out. It's clearly it, yeah. with strings attached. And <laughs> yeah. so if we really want people um, who are living on 2 or $3 a day to live better lives, which is the whole point of all this, which is why I, as a taxpayer, you know, feel comfortable giving some of my money to aid programs, I want that money to actually benefit yeah. the people it's intended for. Yeah. And the best way to do that, it sounds so obvious, is to make sure that we put more cash directly into poor people's hands. There are organizations that do this through basically a, a new handout model. It's, um, it's called, we call it direct cash transfers, to use the development speak jargon. Uh, but basically all that means is we're giving cash directly to poor people, which believe it or not, is still much more effective than the traditional aid model. Because when we give cash to someone who's living on less than $1 or $2 a day, many people are biased and think, oh, these people are going to spend it on drugs or cigarettes or, I don't know, alcohol. Turns out most of them spend it on exactly the right things. Better food, school fees for the children, investing in a local business. They spend it on the same sorts of things we would, we would want for them. So... That's the you know next best thing if we can't create a job for someone for whatever reason is to give cash. How do you do that? There are great organizations. One is called Give Directly. Um, they publish a lot of great data on their website. They're run by development economists. So you can give directly through their website. Um, you can do it as, as tithing. Many people like to give a percentage of their income. Um, and then you can also look at buying. Personally, I think investing a lot of your charitable budget into purchasing from organizations that have fair trade models or that give work is one of the best things that you can do. And that's benefiting often that same kind of population but through a job rather than a handout. So it tends to be more long-term and sustainable. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're talking uh, to, and I'm going to get it right, Lila Jana, L-E-I-L-A Jana, <laughs> the author of a new book called Give Work, Reversing Poverty uh, One Job at a Time, which talks about her experience with Sama Source and Luxme uh, in, in making it possible for people to come out of poverty in a dignified way that's going to be long-term and sustaining. Uh, and it's really, it's really an, uh, a very inspiring thing. So you've talked a little Thank bit you. about what individuals uh, can do. Uh, if, if, if you run a company, people who are watching who, or listening who run companies, what should they do? How could they reinvent their business to help? So chances are your company spends a lot more money on goods and services than you or your family does. And so if we can get companies' budgets to reflect our values the way that our own budgets might at home, that's the real win. Um, if you think about it, somebody at Microsoft decides what kind of rugs to buy, what kind of lighting fixtures to purchase, what sort of coffee should be in the lunchrooms. All of those decisions reflect the values of the company, right? So if you really value um, equality of opportunity, dignity, humanity, um, integrity, then we should be sourcing from vendors that do good in the world. Yeah. And so that means that you should try to find vendors that promote uh, organic farming, for example, vendors that promote fair trade practices. Fair trade just means that workers who were involved in making something were paid fair wages, which frankly should be the default in 2017. Yeah. Um, still, many of the items that we buy are made in, in conditions that would be appalling for any of us to live under or even see. And so um, even if we think about devoting 1% or 5% of a company's spend on goods and services to vendors like this that, that do good idea. Good work. And that's an, e it's a it's an easy, easy thing win. to do. And it's, I think it's more effective than saying we're going to write a check at the end of yeah. the day to absolve ourselves of our sins. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's yeah. so much better to, to put into practice our values with the way that we spend our money. Somebody, f I forget who, famous said that um, our values are reflected in our budgets. And it's true as individuals, really and it's just good. as true as, as companies or even nations. Yeah, uh, I guess social uh, socially aware investing too, that kind of thing? Absolutely. So I, I come into contact with a lot of really cool startups. I was just a, um, a judge for a business plan competition in, in the Netherlands. They are so advanced in this regard. Um, and they have the largest sustainability prize. So these are businesses that are for-profit that are 
investable businesses that are doing really cutting edge things. One company there was developing a plastic based out of bio resin. So completely compostable plastic. Nice. They can actually make kite boards with this plastic. They can make um, particle board, which is one of the biggest, um, actually one of- Because of the formaldehyde. And formaldehyde, the, it's, yeah. it's horrible. It's totally yeah. unsustainable. You can't compost those boards. Yes. You're taking up all this wood. Imagine if you could have compostable particle board in your Ikea furniture. Um, so these are the sorts of businesses that we can choose not only to purchase from, but to invest in. So any tech investors listening to the show, there are tons of really amazing new enterprises where you get a double win. You get you know, a business that will eventually become profitable yeah. and give you a return and a business that's actively doing good in the world. And I think you can even combine money that you would spend on philanthropy uh, into impact investing. So combine your for-profit and non-profit investments into one and choose businesses that achieve a social goal as well as just a profit goal. It, it's it's totally <laughs> inspiring. I, 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 the book is called Give Work, Reversing Poverty One Job at a Time. If uh, A final thought, something uh, that I haven't touched on that you think we should know about? Yeah, so I noticed some of the viewers were talking about what's happening in, in the U.S. and I wanted to share Yeah, we should bit. mention that. I, yeah. Yes, good. So, Because um, we're coming up against a couple of things. First of all, people are going to be out of work. We have our own poverty problems, as you mentioned. There are places where there's no internet, there's no access. Uh, we have some really intractable problems here at home. Could these models work here? Absolutely. And I think we um, we have to admit, we live in a global economy. When I buy you know, pepper at the grocery store, that's made elsewhere. It can't be made in the U.S. A lot of the things, my coffee, you know, isn't grown here. Right. And so we are, as consumers, part of a global economy, which means we have a duty to care about people in Timbuktu as much as we have a duty to care about people in Tennessee, I believe, yes. because we're actively part of that global yes. consumer economy. Um, and that said, I think there's this really false divide between organizations that work on international poverty and organizations that work domestically, and it needn't be the case. So often these issues are so similar, right? And we can adapt models that work well here internationally and vice versa. So several years ago, um, I had when I fart, when I started Samosource, um, I had really wanted to do something domestically, but I couldn't figure out how to make the model work here. We studied it. We looked at poverty in rural communities. We started working in rural Arkansas and the Mississippi River Delta and in uh, Merced, California, as well as New York and San Francisco to see what would work. And we realized that the labor economy in the U.S. is very different from many developing markets. Hmm. So in the last decade, well, actually from, from 2005 to 2015, two prominent labor economists produced a study that showed that all net employment growth happened in the independent labor economy, which means basically gig work or contract work. Interesting. Not full-time jobs. Interesting. Meanwhile, if you look at how we invest in job training as a country, we're entirely focused on full-time jobs. Sure. All of these government workforce development programs, all the job training that we have for people coming out of prison, people coming back from, from serving our country in war, all of these programs are devoted to careers that are going away. And the reality is that we have to adapt our job training to the needs of the current economy, which are more and more contract workers. And I think rather than try to fight that whole trend, let's go with the trend and figure out how to act actively help low income people in the here and now. So we developed a program called Sama School samaschool.org that works to train low-income Americans to benefit from these new labor platforms. So we teach people how to set up profiles on these new platforms like care.com and Field Nation and TaskRabbit. And a lot of these um, companies get a bad rap, but if you actually talk to people living at or under the poverty line, by the way, there are 43 million of them here in the yeah, U.S. Such a tragedy. 43 million people. So unacceptable. Living on less than the federal poverty line, which is for a family of four, $24,600 yeah. for yeah. a family of four people. It's just tragic. Imagine living on that in any big city. It's, it's no. impossible, right? And so we found that actually, ac actually a really effective way to get poor people more income is to show them how they can use these platforms to supplement their earnings. So we have all kinds of, of success stories of people who've moved from $8 an hour minimum wage jobs where they don't have any flexibility in the schedule they don't develop an online reputation. They can't quickly advance. They go from that to a job where you can make 25 or $30 an hour working on your own time and getting the benefit of an online reputation, which most white collar workers, we take for granted. If you have a LinkedIn profile, right. your, your colleagues can review you. Right. If you work at Walmart um, or even you know if you work in, in construction, let's say, and you're a day laborer, 
Good nobody luck. knows. <laughs> nobody knows. You might be the best worker on the job site nobody and knows. no one will know about it. And so I think there is a benefit to moving on to platforms where your wages are transparent. Increasingly, uh, we're working with organizations like the, the National Domestic Workers Alliance, which have put together portable benefits programs. See, that's part of the problem. If you're in the gig economy, you've got no benefits. So you need a way to, I don't, I mean, it might be that you need single payer health care, but you need things like that. <laughs> Can I say that? <laughs> yeah, I know it's very controversial, like but that. that, but but the gig economy doesn't work if you can't get health care. So I think part of what's happening is we're undergoing a massive transition domestically. And what we see as our role at Sama is we know the digital economy. We know how to help people get more money very quickly. And on top of that, we know how to work with nonprofits and bring them into this new tech world. And I think what we need to do is modernize job training and modernize the conversation. Um, the traditional jobs are not coming back. And in lieu of waiting for them, we should be actively figuring out what we can do to help those who most yeah. need it now. We can't, government's been burying its head and we have been burying our heads in the sand. And we can't do that anymore because this transition is going to happen whether we like it or not. And we need to be preparing for it. Otherwise, we're going to, the, the 43 million number is going to go up. More people are going to be in poverty. And, you know, while a lot of the traditional for I can't tell you how many how many arguments I've gotten into with people who lead foundations or people who are in workforce development offices who say, well, I just don't agree that these they are good jobs. They have an investment in the way it works. Yep. And I say, the way it is, you whether know. you agree or not, yeah. this is happening. And the question is, do you yeah. want to be on the right side of right. it? Helping how people How can we make benefit? it work? Absolutely. Yeah. And how can we get these companies that are in charge of these platforms, or importantly, the venture capital firms that invest in them, to agree on a code of ethics for how they want to operate? And the National Domestic Workers Alliance has has really done that. They put together a good work code that these labor platforms, we, we signed on to it as, at Sama School. Um, but, you know, there are many nonprofits that are trying to do that, that are trying to put push these uh, labor platforms in the right, right direction and at the same time push government into the direction of saying this is happening let's figure out how to actually use these tools to benefit the most marginalized people in our society yeah. it, you got to recognize it's going to happen anyway but also we have to rethink because I, th I think part of the problem I know the foundations and the government part of the problem is we think of piecework as not being a sustainable long-term way out of poverty we think of it as a way of sustaining poverty mm -hmm. so there has to, it has to be a rethinking of what Gig work, gig economy is not piecework exactly. No, and you know, the other thing that I find frustrating is that if you actually spend time with people who are making minimum wage or less, or people who are unemployed, what you'll find is that they're often doing, they're hustling. They're right. doing, they're part of the informal economy. A whole chapter anyway. on the hustle. Yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah. and you know, I think, I think denying, denying what they're already doing is, is, futile, right? So I think part of the problem is a lot of the people who design these programs don't necessarily spend time with people who who need to benefit from them. Yeah. And part of what we try to do at our companies is, is look at our beneficiaries as customers. So we actually have a net promoter score exercise that we do. So anyone who benefits from SAMA programs actually rates us the same way that you would you would rate a consumer technology. And we publish internally our, our net promoter score. And part of how I evaluate my management team is, are the people benefiting from our programs? Would they actually recommend it to a friend? Um, and I think we need to bring more of that awareness um, that we have in the tech world about our consumers to the world of philanthropy and, and doing good. Well, you're brilliant. I mean, I think that it's it's real. I can't. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, it, it's really clear that we're we're facing this crisis, and in, and that what we need to do is use what we know to make it work instead of saying no, 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 this can't happen. We've got to figure out how to make it work. And there is a roadmap here. It's called Give Work, <laughs> reversing poverty one job at a time, Lila John. It's been a real pleasure meeting you. You're such an inspiration. Thank you. And I just hope people listen and that we can transform, you know, how we do this so that people do have an opportunity and we can pull people out of poverty here in the United States and all around the world because it's possible. It's doable. We it have is, enough to do this. It's going to happen in our lifetimes. And really, there is no excuse for no anyone excuse. living in avoidable suffering yeah. in 2017. It's avoidable. That's a great word. <laughs> it's avoidable. Lila, pleasure meeting you. Thank you for coming by. Thank I appreciate you so it. Much. And good My luck pleasure. with the book. And everybody should read it. Give work and tell your friends. And now you know what to do. You know, use your 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 your, your budget to, to make a difference in the world. I'm going to do that from now on. That's awesome. great. No more of this not fair trade coffee in our, <laughs> in our break room. Getting rid of that. Uh, we do triangulation every Monday. Uh, well, we do it at different times, but generally 
every Monday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. If you'd like to watch and participate, uh, we invite you to do so. Uh, you can watch twit.tv slash live and watch the live stream and then join us in the chat room at irc.twit.tv because your feedback and your questions and your thoughts are very much a, a part of this show. Um, but if you can't watch uh, live, and I know some of you actually have jobs, things like that. Uh, but this is why the gig economy is great because you have more time for podcasts. <laughs> exactly. I, I think it's a great idea. Uh, <laughs> you can get it on demand if you go to twit.tv slash TRI or use your favorite podcast app to uh, subscribe. I've been kind of on a mission to let everybody know you can use, if you have an Amazon device or any one of these voice uh, devices, you can al always listen to us there. Uh, as an example, you can say, hey, Echo, listen to Twit Live on TuneIn, and that'll give you our live stream at any given time, and there's always something going on. Or you could say, hey, Echo, listen to Triangulation. Uh, on uh, TuneIn. TuneIn's the key word there because it's the TuneIn service that provides our podcasts for your Amazon Echo. I think uh, you can do it on the, I know you can do it on the uh, Google Home as well. I'm, I'm not completely clear on the uh, syntax, but try it. See what happens. <laughs> I don't think you say TuneIn, but I think you can. I know you can because I've done it. Listen, and I hope you will uh, each and every week because triangulation is always something, food for thought, something you can chew on. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time on Triangulation. Bye-bye. That was great.